Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, January 18th, 2021. Today, people close to Trump are selling their access to rich felons that want pardons. Large Bitcoin payments to right-wing terrorists are found a month before the insurrection, and they're linked to foreign accounts. Privileged white supremacists are asking Trump for pardons. HHS Director Azar resigns after lying about vaccine reserves. The Capitol Police have opened an investigation into members of Congress. The My Pillow Guy pitches martial law to Trump while Rudy tries to get paid, and then they try to install Kosh Patel as the acting CIA director. A Virginia man is arrested with fake inauguration credentials and guns. The communications director for Boebert resigns after two weeks, and four House committees open inquiries into foreign participation in the insurrection. I'm AG. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Yeah, so not too much news from the weekend. No, uh, nothing. I mean, there's barely anything at the top of the hour. You know, my pillow, martial law, and uh, you know, Rudy hobbling into the White House there trying to get paid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just um, mm, he's been around just, a long time, AJ. He knows he's not getting paid. Yeah, and they had a falling out, and I'm wondering if he's going to get his pardon or not. We're still waiting on this final pardon push. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I thought we would have it over the weekend. Um, it might come later tonight. That's when they like to do stuff that they don't want to get attention for is Sunday nights, but maybe right. Trump wants attention for it. So maybe he's going to do this on Monday or Tuesday. You know, I, I interesting, we can talk more about this, but and I'll just do it briefly because I know we've got to get into this. We've got a lot of news. I am curious to know, even though McConnell did it for his own purposes on delaying the, the vote, it's also created a situation where Trump knows he can't do too many fucked up things because then the Senate will convict him. So it's interesting because it may have accidentally put him on his whatever his best behavior looks like. Yeah. But that's just like correct collateral beauty from uh, the shit show. Like that's not intentional, but it may benefit us as a country. Maybe it is because, you know, we heard language, really strong language from McConnell last week that he's pissed, hates Trump. This is a chance to purge him from the party. But but making him wait until after he's no longer president kind of kneecaps him, right? Uh, for, For these parties. Pardons, particularly pardons of the insurrectionists who are begging him like oh, these those videos. Yeah. The realtor oh, hey. from Ta- Dallas is my favorite. Bless her heart. The private jet lady. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I, you told me to come here. So can you pardon me, please? I was just following orders. I don't know. Yeah, that worked out really well in Nuremberg. Um, <laughs> so we also today we're going to be discussing uh, Frank Figlusi's new book. He'll be here. He wrote The FBI Way. Uh, and it's really cool because he doesn't just talk about the code of excellence in the FBI. He tells you how you can apply it to your business or your personal life to like, you know, be successful and not be an asshole. And it's it's really quite a wonderful book. I absolutely loved reading it. And there's a lot of stuff that's interwoven with, with this insurrection. It's just interesting that the book, because books take months and months to come out, and now we've got this massive thing coming out, so or happening to our country. So it's going to be really interesting. It's a great discussion, so stick around for that. Uh, but we do have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. Anyway, the lead story today uh, it is just everything. It's all tied for first place. But I'm just going to start with what's unraveling with the attack on the Capitol. This is as we get additional incriminating video from the day of the attack. This is published by The New Yorker. I, I encourage you to go check that out. Uh, although, you know, content warning, it's bad. Um, but the Capitol Police said Friday that they, are, they opened an investigation into whether members of Congress, Congress, inappropriately gave visitors access to the Capitol ahead of the storming of the building last week. And this is after several lawmakers, you know, on the Democratic side, which we talked about earlier, have raised concerns that their own colleagues might have allowed members of a pro-Trump mob inside in the days leading up to the assault. Uh, The inquiry came uh, to light as Pelosi announced that she had named Russell Honore, uh, a retired Army lieutenant general, to lead a security review of the Capitol in the wake of the riot. And I'm excited about this because Honore is perfect for this job. And this is... I mean, this needs to be fully, fully investigated and pledging accountability for those behind January 6th. Pelosi warned that if any Republican members of the House had aided the rioters as they sought to advance Trump's effort to overturn the election results, they would be punished. And Pelosi doesn't speak lightly. They better be. 
There's got to be some sort of consequence. But just the indication that, you know, because I put out that thread on, on January 8th saying this is in, it's got to be an inside job. Which members of Congress gave them access? Who, you know, without we hadn't seen any evidence yet, but it seemed pretty obvious to me that people like Gosar and uh, Biggs and, and Bobert. <laughs> Not to <laughs> mention a- there was a specific memo put out by the House that I saw from one of the House members that literally forbid any tours Mm -hmm. as they were getting ready for security for the the boat. That was another big thing on January 5th, because we we learned a couple days ago that Mikey Sherrill, the the, uh, Dem rep, was like, I need an investigation into which were were there reconnaissance tours. Mm -hmm. And then we found out after that this weekend that there, you're just like you said. There's a me- there was a memo that specifically went out from de- from the, from the Capitol P- Police saying, "Hey, you got to stop that." And and then of course we know the Capitol Police chief resigned, and we know the Sergeant at Arms for both the House and the Senate resigned. There's something really f- fishy going on. And uh, yeah. Nancy doesn't just say if she doesn't just make these allegations lightly. Um, and four House committees, the Intelligence Committee, Homeland Security, Judiciary, and Oversight, are opening a review of the Capitol insurrection and threats to stop the transfer of power. And they're also specifically requesting information on whether the insurrection had any nexus to foreign influence. Uh, and this news comes on the heels of an exclusive from Yahoo News, of all, of all news outlets. But congrats to Yahoo for this scoop, that on December 8th, December 8th, Someone made a, a simultaneous transfer of 28.15 bitcoins, that's worth like a half a million dollars, to 22 different virtual wallets, most of them belonging to prominent right-wing organizations. Jesus. And we know cryptocurrency to be a very, very rife with money laundering to cover up, you know, when people try to follow the money. It's hard. It's... They think it's hard to do with Bitcoin, but it's not. Uh, But now cryptocurrency researchers believe they have identified who made the transfer and suspect it was intended to bolster those far-right causes. Law enforcement is investigating whether the donations were linked to the assault on the Capitol. According to one source familiar with the matter, the suspicious transaction on December 8th, along with a number of other pieces of intelligence, has prompted law enforcement and intelligence agencies to actively investigate the sources of funding. And that's what I was talking about a minute ago. And now two Virginia men have been arrested, one that presented false inauguration credentials and had guns, and the other who had guns. It wasn't supposed, like, not authorized guns. Mm -hmm. And the Washington Post caught a photo of some notes that my pillow guy, Lindell, brought into a meeting with Trump that included invoking martial law and installing Kosh Patel as the head of the CIA. And we'll have more on the CIA's reaction a little bit later, because what's interesting is we're all laughing at the my pillow guy, like <laughs> Kosh Patel, CIA. Well, apparently that actually uh, was attempted, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, and then, of course, we're waiting for pardons. We'll see what happens there. My goodness. There's more. There's more coming out. I actually really like this. It's, there's some good people still left. Uh, the communications director for Rep. Lauren Boebert, or I think her last name is really close to Breitbart, and that's what I want to call her because <laughs> she's probably just as nutty. Um, her communications director uh, in Colorado, um, a firebrand Republican, as we know who she is, who boasts about carrying a gun to work, has quit. Her communications director quit after less than two weeks on the job. So Ben Goldie's resignation cited last week's insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, which came amid efforts of Boebert and, as we saw, other Republican lawmakers to block the certification of Joe Biden's Electoral College victory. Uh, Her rhetoric on the issue mirrored President Trump's, which has fueled baseless election conspiracy theories and resulting in violence. Now, Goldie is uh, said in a statement to Axios, following the events on January 6th, I've decided to part ways with the office. I wish her and the people of Colorado's third district the best. Mm. Now, what's really interesting is that, you know, we've talked about lawmakers, our congressmen and women that are actually afraid not of the insurrections, but that they're going to be killed by a fellow member of Congress. Mm -hmm. And I bet, you know, I'm just assuming if they had to name names, she would probably be on the short list. Yeah. And we were right to assume that uh, that they were going to start. They put that metal detector up. And yep. uh, and they and they would refuse to go through it. So now she now Pelosi's going to find them five thousand dollars for the first time and ten thousand dollars each additional time to come directly out of their salaries if they don't use the if they don't use the metal detector. Good. These are the same assholes that were in and they should have been applauding the Capitol Police, but they completely disrespected them three hours earlier when they wouldn't go through their metal detectors. I mean, come mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And then she's also finding people for wearing not wearing masks. Which yeah, is good. She can yeah. do that. 
Uh, and CIA director, this is what I was talking about a minute ago, the CIA director, Gina Haspel, as we know, she threatened to resign in December. December. After President Trump cooked up a plan to install Kash Patel, that's, you know, he's a former aide to Devin Nunes, and he was the guy, you know, I mean, he's just mm. a, a terrible dude. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and wanted to stick stick him in there as her deputy. And that's according to three senior administration officials with direct knowledge. The revelation stunned national security officials and almost blew up the leadership of the world's most powerful spy agency. Only a series of coincidences and last minute interventions from Pence and Pat Cipollone stopped it. So meanwhile, they've been trying to get Michael Ellis in as the NSA general counsel. Remember back when they put Kosh Patel and Cohen Watnick and Chris Miller in at the Pentagon and took out the one, three, and four people and replaced mm-hmm. them with those people? Mm-hmm. They also that day tried to shove Michael Ellis into the NSA general counsel, head lawyer at the NSA. And the NSA wasn't that into him. So <laughs> uh, they did, sort of just didn't do it. And I, I thought he was already in, but apparently he had to take a polygraph and, and they had to make it official. But the NSA didn't do it. And finally, uh, Chris Miller, um, the, who's, you know, the, the new acting secretary of defense, forced it, forced the thing this Saturday. He, he, he wanted... Um, he wanted this uh, Michael Ellis guy to be put into that lead that role at the NSA by Saturday at six, and it didn't happen. The the NSA just ignored the deadline, but they they did make it happen today on Sunday. So he is now burrowed, and so basically what they're doing is they're you know this isn't a political appointee. This is actually a job, mm-hmm. and so it's harder to get rid of right uh, than than normal. However, we know Trump signed an executive order creating a new Schedule F of policymakers that could be removed for cause at any time for any reason, no. and he did that because he he wanted disloyal people to be able to be easily removed. Uh, from government work because it's it's very hard to to fire someone from the government. Um, but that that's what they're trying to do. That and I'm sure they're trying to declassify a bunch of stuff before they get out. Uh, or there there's he's trying to do something that we don't have we aren't diabolically evil enough to imagine. Uh, and we might find out in the next few days, you know. Oh my God, yeah, the next three days. Hold on to your hats. I'm telling you yeah. right now, you're yep. gonna see shit you didn't even imagine. Ugh. Anyway, um, this news more coming out of this completely botched rollout of the vaccine. Um, When Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar announced this week that the federal government would begin releasing coronavirus vaccine doses that had been in reserve for second shots, apparently no such reserve existed, according to state and federal officials briefed on the distribution plans. Now, uh, the Trump administration had already begun shipping out what was available starting at the end of December, taking second doses for the two-dose regiment directly off the manufacturing line. So health officials across the country who had anticipated their extremely limited vaccine supply as much as doubling beginning next week are confronting the reality that their allocations will remain largely flat. That's dashing hopes of dramatically expanding access for millions of elderly people and those with high-risk medical conditions. Uh, Health officials in some cities and states were informed in recent days about the reality of the situation while others were still in the dark on Friday. So just shortly after we learned about the vaccine reserve, Alex Azar citing the violent Capitol riot inflamed by, as we know, President Trump in his resignation letter, letter, excuse me, obtained by NBC News. Azar said in his resignation um, would become effective January 20th, the same date. I know. What the fuck? Uh, So the same date, as we know, that uh, Trump's going to be leaving office once uh, President-elect Joe Biden is sworn in. Apparently, that's also the date Azar decided he was going to be leaving office. Um, The letter was dated January 12th, and that's almost a week after the riot. I mean, this was just a fail of epic proportions all the way around, and Mm -hmm. I do hope that our new, soon-to-be president and vice president can iron out these sharpay like wrinkles that we seem to have in this distribution yeah and if we can't get the second shot does it does it make the first shot null and void and we have to start over again does it does it make the the 10 12 15 million vaccines that have been allocated useless does it right. does it put us starting back at zero all good and, questions and um, you know azar is like oh yeah well i'm gonna resign not because I fucking lied about a reserve of vaccines. And by the way, where did those go? Were they sold out the back door by Kushner to China? I don't know. Uh, we have no idea where they went. I'm sure we'll find out. 
But, you know, Azar is like, yeah, I'm going to I am going to resign a week after the insurrection. He's like, that was on. That was horrible. I quit on January 20th. Oh, God, I don't use I won't even use the P word. But man, these are some cowards. They're just a bunch of cowards. It just does. It just doesn't make any sense. You're, you're going to be gone on the tw- <sighs> fuck off. Anyway, uh, we'll be right back with Frank Figluzzi. We're going to discuss his new book, The FBI Way, and how timely it is considering where we are with regards to our democracy. So stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey everybody, it's AG, and this episode of Daily Beans is brought to you by Helix Sleep. As you know, I've had a lot of trouble sleeping the past four years. I thought it had to do with the orange menace, which it did a little bit, but also turned out I was sleeping on a garbage mattress that was not customized for me because I have specific needs and specific sleep patterns. But all my sleep issues have been solved by Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep understands that you're unique. They customize your mattress to fit you and the way that you sleep best. Helix Sleep created an online sleep quiz that takes two minutes to complete, and they use the answers to match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. So if you like a mattress that's soft or firm, or if you sleep on your side or your belly or your back, or you sleep really hot, whatever it is, Helix has a specific mattress for each and everybody's unique taste. Like me, I was matched with the Midnight, the Helix Midnight, because I like my bed medium firm, and I sleep on my side. So it's perfect for me. But you don't have to take my word for it, or Joelle's word for it, or Mandy's, or Jordan's. We all love our Helix mattress. Helix was actually awarded number one best overall mattress of 2019 in 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 sleeps, risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll pick it up for you, no hassle, but you will love it. And Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash dailybeans. That's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash dailybeans for up to $200 off. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Joining me today is my friend, former assistant director of the FBI for counterintelligence and author of the new book, The FBI Way, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence, Frank Figluzzi. Frank, welcome. I'm so glad we could do this in the the midst of what is a frenzy, frenzy time in the history of our country. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, I, I, your book is incredible. It's well written, but it's also very pertinent and prescient. And I think it's very important that we talk about this. I think everybody needs to read this book because it's, first of all, thank you for sending me a copy. I chewed through it in just a couple of days. Um, and, and what I like is that not only do you use personal anecdotes and examples to illustrate what you refer to as the seven C's of the FBI, but you highlight through lines that underpin the foundation of the FBI and you tell us how we can apply these concepts to our own projects. And I think that that's wonderful. So let me ask you about when the seeds of this book were planted, as you put it, in the introduction, while you were holed up in an undisclosed location as the FBI's designated survivor during the 2012 State of the Union. I didn't know the FBI had a designated survivor. Yeah, in fact, I had to get even even that revelation, I had to get cleared by the FBI's pre-publication review office, and they had to chew on that for a few days. But yes, indeed, I think people need to understand. And there's great, there's great, as you said, applicability to this entire concept of designated survivor. So people for the entire nation. So people need to understand that every key agency um, during the night of the State of the Union address has to send a senior representative to a bunker. Um, and it's not all the same bunker, but there is there is one where predominantly most of the continuity of government executives will be. And it's because of the old concept that if if that State of the Union address uh, cap- in the Capitol building gets hit by a major assault or nuclear attack, much of a lo- the leadership in our government will be taken out. So it was my turn one year. And while I'm sitting there on a very long night, deep underground, I'm thinking, Boy, this is pretty surreal. Um, but what is it that would allow, what is it about the FBI that keeps it going on a regular basis over the decades? And it certainly it wouldn't be me that preserves the concept of the FBI, but it's really the concept of preserving core values of the FBI and for the nation. And my my applicability to the crisis we're going through right now is that each and every one of us should view ourselves as a kind of designated survivor for the core values of this country. Because let me tell you something, the people who breached the security at the Capitol the other day were not thinking about the survival of our core values as a nation. No. Yeah, no, you're right. And and this this isn't a, a new concept. We see it in pop culture all the time. We see it 
Um, it, you know, we, we stress the importance of, of continuity of government um, and, and not just government, whatever it is, like the Vulcan elders in Star Trek. You know, they all have to be ushered off to safe locations in case something happens to the planet. And, uh, you know, then they carry on the core values of the society. Uh, and and that right now, especially in times of transition, and you've mentioned this on our show before, we're very vulnerable in national security wise um, during during a transition. And and with all of the vacant leadership positions we have right now, even more so. So I, I can I can understand the concept of carrying on the core values of the FBI throughout this this particular transition as being incredibly important. Yeah, I've commented on, on my television appearances about the you know, we're all focused on how we view uh, the crisis in Washington and whether or not anyone's in charge. Can you imagine how things are uh, questions that are being asked at the Kremlin in Beijing or mm-hmm. in Tehran or in North Korea about is anyone in charge? And far more disturbingly, is this the moment in time when the adversary decides they can move on us because this is a rare opportunity to do so. And when I when I say move on us, I don't I don't necessarily mean boots on the ground we're going to be invaded, but rather um, maybe it's that debilitating, crippling cyber attack on our infrastructure that we know our adversaries could pull off. And now in this environment, create complete chaos. Or maybe it's time for China to go into Taiwan or Russia to annex yet another territory they have their eye on, or Iran to give the order to Hezbollah to attack U.S. interests somewhere, or for North Korea to launch yet another missile even closer to Japan, all while they wonder whether we are even capable of pushing back on them right now. That's what keeps me up at night, among many other things. Yeah, yeah. Mom and dad are out of town. So let's have a let's have a kegger. And and you know, and and now we have uh, it, it doesn't have to come from from outside our country, as we've seen. Um, we're in a very weakened position when what happened on January 6th happened, although now we're starting to get reports of uh, foreign funding uh, to the insurrection. But we can talk about that another time. I want to talk about the seven C's uh, here in your book, which you list as and this book is put together. So uh, logically, I love it. He lists as code, <laughs> code, conservancy, clarity, consequences, compassion, credibility, and consistency. And let's start with code, because you say living by a code is important, and it has to do a, a lot with why you joined. And apparently you had you told a story in your book about many people questioning why you were going in. You're going to take a pay cut. You're going to, uh, you know, these are uh, things that I heard when I decided to, to work for the government or when I decided to join the military. Why would you do this? Yeah, I tell the story in the book of when I was 11 years old and wrote a letter to the special agent in charge of the FBI field office in New Haven, Connecticut, because I I lived in Connecticut, and told them at age 11 that I wanted to be an FBI agent. And lo and behold, the guy wrote me back Mm -hmm. and and, uh, told me what I needed to do. So I was someone who got it at a pretty young age that, you know, there's good and bad in this world, and there's people who fight for justice. And yes, I was naive. And yes, the world is not black and white like that. But that's how early I wanted to do it. And I actually ended up going to law school with the primary goal of of if I could get in to becoming an FBI agent. So, look, the the first chapter on code is is really about on many levels, family, personal, individual level, right up to the nation. And if you're if you're a leader in a company, if you if you have a team, whether you're you know, you're, you're in charge of a bakery or you're in charge of a Fortune 10 company, these same principles apply. You better have core values in your life, in your business, in your nation. And they have to be well-versed and and exercised. And if you have core values, that then allows you to distinguish between conduct that is allowable and conduct that must never, ever be allowed to happen. And if you do that, you can then identify threats to your core values. Because I like to say, as, as as many have said before, And if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And boy, isn't that pretty much a description of what this entire nation has gone through? Those people who committed insurrection at the Capitol, they lost sight of the core values of the United States. They are playing by another code. And and that's why the book is so applicable to what's happening today. Yeah, you saw their what they thought of as their code as, you know, the thin blue line and law and order and back the blue. And you saw that completely crumble 
uh, within minutes. And so, you know, it, it's it's shocking when you <laughs> when you don't actually stand for something, how you'll fall for anything, just like you said. Um, I want to talk about conservancy because that's your next C in the book here and how agents are stewards of an entity that is greater than themselves. And that struck me because I was reminded of the piece in the Atlantic this past summer about Trump referring to veterans and service members as suckers and losers and how he can't, he couldn't grab, like we were all sitting there like who goes after veterans? Who goes after American war dead? It is someone who cannot grasp the idea of conservancy or doing anything for a selfless reason or for a a cause greater than themselves. It was just mind boggling. Yeah, I I wrote the book largely uh, driven by that idea in that chapter that that second that second C as you say conservancy because first of all I was so tired of the what I call the bureau bashing by this president the attacks on the FBI the institution that I dedicated twenty five years to and this is my retort saying you know what not only is the bureau and the men and women the rank and file of the bureau not what Trump is claiming it is, but actually it's even better in, at getting values preserved and performing at the highest level of excellence when the stakes matter the most, like right now in this country. And it's got a better track record of performance and success than most successful Fortune 100 companies. So here it is as a template, a model. And that notion of conservancy, which we need more than ever before, is ingrained in you from day one at the FBI Academy that you are accountable for not only your conduct, but for the greater reputation of the FBI. And so it starts with things like, you know, I tell the story of my first office in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a young agent. I'm loaded down with my cases. And the supervisor taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, uh, Frank, I got another case for you. What he meant was it's time for me to investigate a car accident between an agent and a civilian, which by the way is a routine thing um, in the FBI, you've got to determine who did what, do a full-blown investigations, diagram, sketches, interviews, photos, and you've got to make a call on that and turn it in as a valid, really no whitewash investigation. That's one of your first signs that it's on you. You you suddenly become responsible for the other agent on your squad, and you got to get that right because it's taken seriously. I also tell the story of, you know, that code and conservancy being ingrained at the academy, your first day on the firearms range when the firearms instructor shouts over the PA system, now move forward and score your target, right? And you look around and you go, you mean I'm scoring my target? I'm being entrusted to accurately, honestly tell you how many bullets I put in this target? That that's that's a, that needs to happen on a national level, on a community level, uh, on a corporate level. We have to remember collectively it's a team sport preserving democracy. Yeah. And that accountability is one of those uh, through lines I mentioned earlier, which goes through all of these uh, C's, all of the all of the C's that you mentioned. And, uh, you know, I remember being in the military. I was a nuclear reactor operator. And they're like, look you have to tell us if something goes wrong and it's you don't get in trouble i mean unless you did it intentionally or whatever but it's it's so very important we did this in the hospital at the department of veterans affairs too people's lives are on the line safety is on the line and the reputation of our agency is on the line and so please it was this it was uh it was a, a culture of coming forward and being accountable because and, and being proud of that, not being ashamed of that you messed something up. But, you know, you everyone else's lives are on the line and so and, and as well as the reputation. So it was just you're right. It's ingrained in you. It's impossible to forget. Um, and I think that kind of meshes with the next C, which is clarity. You talk about well-defined rules so agents can act with certainty when the rules are well-defined. Uh, and they can understand accountability and what they're accountable for. But, of course, that all changes when there's a leadership failure, right? And I'm thinking of what it must have been like for someone like McCabe to traverse a lack of clarity in the bureau, when, you know, when Trump was, quote, unquote, in charge. Yeah, the concept of clarity is is pretty simple, yet so hard to achieve sometimes. And I give war story examples of cases never before cleared, quite frankly, in the FBI, where we brought clarity to the nation after 9-11, who did what, when, who was responsible. And then 
really brought, brought clarity to neighborhoods throughout the country about who who the bad guys were and who weren't. But the concept on a bigger level of clarity is simply this. You, you can't enforce a code. You can't have core values if nobody knows what they are. And I wonder on a national level whether or not we are still teaching our kids successfully, clearly, with clarity, what America stands for. Because look, we had an insurrection largely fueled by fabrications and falsehoods and, 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 and conspiracy theories. And so the lack of clarity in this nation, I would think, is at its, its highest level. We lack clarity more than ever before. And, and there's no sign that this is going to let up as we continue to be amplified and fueled by, by social media platforms that are essentially extremist echo chambers. We need clarity. You need clarity in your team, your organization, your own life. What is it? What are the lines that we can't cross? I talk about in that chapter in the FBI's internal code enforcement, what they call a bright line. You can't cross this line as an FBI employee. What's that bright line in the FBI? Lying under oath. Why? If you lie under oath, you are useless mm. as an FBI employee because we can <laughs> never put you on the witness stand because whether you lied about a chocolate bar missing from the break room or whatever, you're forever more impeached and has to be disclosed to the defense counsel in your own investigative cases. Well, what is the bright line in your company that shouldn't be crossed that, that poses an existential threat to your mission and success? And what is the bright line in this country that we should never cross? And you mentioned you mentioned uh, impugning the troops by Trump. That, that there's one. <laughs> but how about you know how about going with a free and fair election and a safe, uh, peaceful transition of power? There's another bright line that is being crossed. Yeah, and we've talked about those norms all the time. And uh, again, that that uh, that underpinning of accountability is there. And that leads directly to consequences, which I want to talk to you about. But I have to take a break. If, if you don't mind, will you stick around? Yeah, let's do it. All right, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG. And this portion of Daily Beans is brought to you by the most delicious thing I've ever put in my mouth and is surprisingly good for you. It's called Magic Spoon Cereal. I grew up uh, loving cereal as a kid. I would plop down in front of Saturday morning cartoons and watch Tom and Jerry and eat my cereal. But as an adult, I've had to give it up because of all the carbs and sugar and guilt. But Magic Spoon is so good you won't believe it's healthy. Forbes magazine says, with cereal that tastes as good and offers so much nutritional value, as opposed to, well, none, Magic Spoon may be the future of breakfast. And I totally agree, because the, these cereals have amazingly zero grams of sugar, 12 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs per serving. It is keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, high-protein, and GMO free. And the best part, it's delicious. It is so good. I was shocked. I was so shocked by how good it is. And they have four amazing flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. So you get a little bit of the nostalgia there. My favorite is cocoa right now, so I can drink the chocolatey milk afterwards. But go to magicspoon.com slash dailybeans and grab a variety pack. Try all four flavors today. Be sure to use our promo code dailybeans at checkout to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product because it's rad, uh, that it is also backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund all of your money. No questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash dailybeans and use the code dailybeans for free shipping. And we thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are talking with author of The FBI Way, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence with Frank Figaluzzi, also former assistant director of the FBI for counterintelligence. Uh, and everybody knows you here, so we're just really happy to talk to you. But this book is so incredible. And before the break, we were talking about um, accountability and well-defined rules and clarity. And, and that ties directly with the next C, which is consequences. And you discussed the concept of a second and third of second and third order thinking, and I was hoping you could explain what that means. Yeah, one of the really neat things about uh, being in the high stakes world of of uh, the FBI, where literally not it's not over dramatic to say you come into work and there's a likelihood there's a life and death decision or a national security decision. It could be a kidnapping, it could be facing down a, a violent gang member. Or it could be uh, an espionage case where some vital national secrets being stolen. But you, FBI agents and particularly leaders, understand how to make decisions that that go through their mind quickly as they go through a decision tree. If I do this, then this happens. Third, second and third order consequences, seeing around corners in your mind about the impact of your decisions and. Um, you get very, very good at it. But here's how you get really good at it is 
is you keep going back to your core values. You don't you don't move off of that the, identifying existential threats to what you stand for. And so I talk about how the FBI gets very good at doing the right thing, even when it's incredibly painful or hurts them the most. And I give a couple of examples. One is a lot of people don't know this, but as I talk about in the book, the FBI had a significant presence at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, um, as the detainees uh, and hostile combatants were being held um, at that Navy base 90 miles off the shore of Florida. Well, I was the uh, guy in charge of counterterrorism branch at FBI Miami for that. And FBI Miami was initially given responsibility for the FBI's presence at Gitmo. Now you say, why in heaven's name were FBI agents present at Guantanamo Bay? Well, because um, we needed to know immediately whether there was a, an ongoing threat to the homeland. And so we didn't want any gap in time between, say, the CIA or the military interrogating a detainee, finding that there was a threat to the homeland and getting it to us. We wanted to be there for that and ask our questions and get our answers. So one day, my agents came back from their trip to Guantanamo Bay, came into my office in Miami and closed the door and said, we've had to walk out of interrogations down there. And they had to walk out because while the FBI was charged with developing potential criminal cases in U.S. criminal courts against these folks, they were witnessing coercive, excessive use of techniques in those interrogations that we could not abide by in the FBI because it would negate using anything gained in a court of law. And so um, I could have just said, and those agents could have just said, you know what, we're going to look the other way. These are bad actors. We don't care what happens to them in these interrogation rooms. But they didn't do that. And at great risk to the FBI, the FBI director raised this flag that we had brought to him and said to the entire community in the White House, hey, we can't do this. Somebody's got to decide who's in charge of these interrogations because you can't have it both ways. You can't prepare for court and use these coercive techniques. That was a painful decision, but we did the right thing. And ultimately, the FBI was put in charge of high value detainee interrogations. Well, you had the expertise and the and the <laughs> you had the math on your side for that. I remember that it was called Operation Stellar Wind, and um, there was a lot of uh, back and forth and and pushback from the FBI saying, "Look, we we're we're pros at interrogating. You're doing it wrong, first of all, and you're going to make it impossible for us to pursue charges. Well, prosecutors pursue charges, but you know what I mean. So, we yeah, we've gone over that pretty extensively uh, on the show, and you know those consequences are. You have to th you have to weigh them, but they're very important because I mean, I, we used to do this too when I was in the military or when I was working for the VA. Every single policy decision you made, especially as you got higher up in the organization, you had to think before you made that decision. Does it align with the mission, vision, and vision and values of of the organization? Every single decision, uh, and it's it's incredibly important. And then that brings in the next C, which I love. This is the compassion element. It's fairly straightforward, but also critical to the underpinnings of service. Tell us about the practical application of compassion in what you do. Yeah, I think the outsider's perception of the Bureau, and certainly so far, even our discussion, uh, AG, might seem like I've written a fairly harsh, rigorous, uh, law enforcement sounding book about strict compliance. And you know, I have, but the, but the reality is that if you are going to enforce core values, if you want people to, to understand that you've got a fair, credible system where you can raise your hand, and boy, has this been applicable to the whistleblower phenomenon in this particular administration that we've lived through, can someone raise their hand and say, I've got examples of abuses and I need to come forward somewhere in some mechanism where I, this is going to be treated seriously and fairly. If you don't have that fairness, if you don't have that human element, then you might as well just get an algorithm in a computer to to decide how you dole out discipline in your organization or team. Even on a national level, you could get a computer algorithm to call balls and shots in a courtroom in any criminal proceeding, come up with a precedent database and uh, the sentencing guidelines, and you don't need judges. Here's the thing. We need the human element in any kind of 
fair implementation of core values and code and compliance. And the human element, I it, for parts of my career, I was the guy in charge of disciplinary decisions, in my case, in a unit in the Office of Professional Responsibility, responsible for the eastern half of the United States for deciding discipline in the eastern half of the Bureau involving serious allegations of misconduct. And then late, much later, as a senior executive, I became the chief inspector of the FBI, responsible for making hard calls against uh, personnel and program audits uh, in the bureau. So if you do it without compassion, it's not going to work. People are people are not going to fall in line. They'll never adapt your values. Um, and that's that's where you are. And I think one of the things you can point to here is on a national scale is putting kids in cages at the border. Right. So, yes, you've got a you're a tough as nails, you know, law and order president. You're going to strictly enforce security at the border. And by God, if we have to separate kids from their moms um, as infants and toddlers, we're going to stick them in cages. Yeah, that's great. Anybody signing up for that with any credibility? Is any is anybody is it, how many Americans are going? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm OK with that. Well, unfortunately, a large number are. But that lacks total compassion and the human factor. And eventually, as president has learned in the election, People, the majority of people won't buy that because it lacks the human element. Yeah, the old uh, I was just following orders defense. And we know how well that's worked out in history. Um, and that leads us now to what I think is probably and, you know, I, I couldn't rank these, but this is one of my one of what I think is the most important. And that's the credibility um, factor. The, and I, because that's what's been under constant attack by this administration. And that is one of, you know, num number two in Timothy Snyder's 20 things you need to do. Um, you know, you have to defend institutions because they don't defend themselves. Uh, but once the credibility is attacked, it's, there's so much work that has to be done to, to regain it. And, and I think maybe that's why I rank this one so highly is because of what, what has happened to, to the credibility of the FBI, of all, all our intelligence community under this administration. Yeah, the, one of the more painful things of the last four years for me as a uh, someone coming out of the Bureau was how horribly the career professionals have been treated, denigrated, and because the FBI lives and dies by its credibility. When you flash those credentials at a citizen's door and you ask for help, as by the way, is going on 24 seven right now in your town and city as the FBI races against the clock to stop the next act of domestic terrorism. And we are asking for help like never before. And people are answering the call, hundreds of thousands of leads and tips have come into the Bureau, but that's all based on a concept that the public can trust the credibility and uh, of the FBI. And boy, Trump tried to absolutely destroy that. And, and that's what prompted me to go, that's it. It's really time for me to write this book, not only to defend the men and women of the FBI, but even more importantly, because I saw the mission going down the tubes, because I saw public trust going down the tubes. So this isn't a book that says the FBI is perfect. It is not. And this chapter gives examples of that. Um, but it is a book that says credibility depends on not perfection, but your passion for getting things right, which means when you screw up and the FBI does screw up and we may find in hearings after this insurrection that the FBI could have done a whole lot better. You've got to come forward as a leader, say we screwed up and here's how we're going to fix it or you lack credibility. And one of the noteworthy hallmarks of, of the Trump administration has been his absolute refusal to ever say, I made a mistake. I got this wrong. Yeah. And I think what we're watching now, what we're witnessing now with the hundreds of thousands of tips and, and you know, all of the field offices across the country working together to, to to collar these insurrectionists, which are I think there's over 300 cases open now. They've you know, and the work that's going into it, I, I think, is going a long way to, first of all, show that that Trump's attack on the credibility of the bureau didn't really work very well, um, and th that this can help build back, build that back. I mean, it's terrible that we have to go through these things uh, in order to do that. But I think that that's kind of a silver lining here is seeing the the country come together uh, in support of of law enforcement here to go after these these people who attacked our democracy. Agreed, and I give examples and in, in that chapter on credibility of how Comey 
as well intentioned and as high uh, integrity as he has, actually, actually, his his flaws and his error in judgment handed Trump a reason to f- not only fire him but to attack the credibility of the FBI. Mm. Yeah, we're not we're not happy with him. He should go away um, or at least stop showing up on MSNBC uh, because I don't understand his uh, his decision to think that like Biden should or pardon Trump and we shouldn't hold him accountable for it. That just kind of goes against all of these values that you've been talking uh, about in this book. Um, and we'll see what happens because we're still waiting for that pardon list. I'm I'm with you. I'm sure we could spend a whole hour on Comey and, and I won't do that. But <laughs> But yeah, I mean, um, look, healing the nation in this case is going to involve uh, sticking to a code and saying to the world, this can never happen again. 100%. Hundred percent, and and then finally you discussed uh, consistency, which I think is so incredibly important. I remember reading Andy McCabe's book, and he talked about the steps that you must take to open an investigation, and there has to be articulable facts, and 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 everybody knows that, and it's ingrained in them, and you're consistent about it. And this is very big in government because you know there's especially when it comes to discipline, which you did, you know, like you said. If you're not consistent, then y- there are holes in your ability to to carry out the mission. If you if you don't apply the exact same rules to to everyone with compassion, mind you, uh, you you're going to not be taken seriously. Your 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 decisions are not going to have credibility, and that's why consistency is is key. Well, I chose consistency as the last chapter because I do want to end on a hopeful note, and and that means that you. This nation can get through this stress we're under. An executive in a company can get through the crisis that his business is in. The family uh, crisis that many people are in right now has an end in sight if, if we all stick to what got us here in the first place. Core values on a national level mean the rule of law, the Constitution, three equal branches of government. And when you're under the most stress, It's human nature to actually throw up your hands, panic, and abandon all protocols and values and say, I've never seen this threat before. I think there must be a different way to handle this. And that's the absolute worst time to abandon um, your, your values, your protocols, and training. And I give example after example in the FBI where, look, they face unprecedented threats every single day. I was the on scene commander at the largest hazardous materials crime scene in the history of the FBI, the site of the first anthrax murder in history in Boca Raton, Florida. And we could have thrown up our hands and said, we've never had an anthrax murder before. We've never done a crime scene in a three-story, 60,000 square square foot building filled with microscopic anthrax spores. We don't know what to do. And, And we stopped and said, wait a minute, is this a crime scene? Yes. Do we do crime scenes really well? Yes. Is it a hazmat scene and are we trained in hazmat? Yes. Okay. So it's a hazmat crime scene. Let's do it. That's what this nation has to do. Are we a democracy? Yes. Do we believe collectively in the rule of law, the constitution and three equal branches of government? Well, most of us do. Then fight like hell against anything that threatens that and we'll get through it. Yeah, and something the FBI is is really good at uh, because of that consistency. It's something our country, our democracy, is really good at is is moving through unprecedented events using our same core values and coming out the other side and then reviewing it. I think you call it a hot wash in the FBI, where we go look back and say, "Here's everything that we did. Here's where we fell short," and then you can modify going forward because this is a brand new situation. And oh well, we've learned this, and 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 that kind of accountability. I mean, that takes all of these things into account. And that's where I think we are at, at, at this point in our democracy. And so you start with that hot wash concept at the beginning of the book and you end with the ops plan, uh, which is how we move forward. So I, I think those things kind of come together at this point, don't they? Yeah, it all it all ideally does come together, but we have to understand those seven C's. This is a team sport. It's collective. Keep your eyes on the core values. Demand credibility in your life and, and in those of our elected officials. Um, and and we will get through this thing. Uh, don't give up hope. There's life lessons in the book. I hope they mean something to someone somewhere. I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it. 
Yeah, me too. Everybody, check it out. It's called The FBI Way, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence. These are lessons you can take into your personal life, your personal business, and that will help you kind of see where we're going as a country, uh, you know, as a whole, because we're going through so many things right now. But macro to micro, these lessons are all the same. And I appreciate this book. It's really well written. Check it out by Frank Figaluzzi. Frank, thanks for taking the time today. Oh, no, thank you for having me and uh, stay safe. Yes, we'll 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 talk soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everybody, it's AG, and this portion of the podcast is brought to you by Plush Care. With everything going crazy in these uncertain days, it puts things in perspective a lot, and it reminds us that our health is very important. (laughs) Just, we have to keep healthy. And despite everything that's going on now, it's crucial to be able to see a doctor when you're not feeling well. And it's been made hard, but that's why Plush Care is awesome, because Plush Care provides primary and urgent health care through virtual appointments, so you can stay home. And scheduling an appointment, even for the same day, is super easy. I just pick a slot online that works, click twice, bang, it's booked online, so I don't waste any time on hold, and I don't have to sit in a crowded waiting room. With Plush Care memberships, I get to see my doctor from the comfort of my own home, even while I'm still in my pajamas. And with Plush Care, I get diagnosed, treated, and can even have a prescription sent to my local pharmacy if needed, all within minutes. And if I have any questions before or after my visit, I get to send unlimited messages to my care team any time of the day. Plus, Plush Care accepts most major insurance carriers, and it's available in all 50 states. And with how difficult things are, if you're feeling anxious or depressed or stressed about what's going on, Plush Care doctors are here to help because they can discuss treatment options and provide prescriptions as needed. I can tell you personally, my Plush Care experience has been so easy. Signing up was a breeze. It only took a minute. It was just as easy to schedule an appointment. The entire process has been convenient, very user-friendly. I was immediately comfortable with my doctor, too, and I felt confident because all Plush Care doctors graduated from one of the top 50 medical schools in the U.S., and they're all highly rated by their patients. So I have peace of mind that I'm getting the highest quality health care, and I've got super fast access. Plush Care makes it easy for me to get the excellent care I need. And with Plush Care, I don't put off seeing a doctor, and neither should you. So no more excuses. Make your appointment today. Go to plushcare.com slash dailybeans. That's P-L-U-S-H-C-A-R-E dot com slash dailybeans. That's plushcare.com slash dailybeans. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the goodies. Please keep sending in your good news. We need the good news stories and confessions and corrections. Yes, and my good news is that I'm glad you're feeling better. And also, I got to, uh, I took a wave runner out because I really enjoyed doing that in the ocean. And um, we found pods and pods of dolphins. And dolphins are amazing because if they don't want to play with you, they will swim away and uh, you can avoid them. But if they do want to play with you, it doesn't matter which direction you go. If they want to play and jump in your wake, they will do it. And ah, dozens and dozens were just hanging out with me. Went about 10 miles an hour so we could all just float together. It was beautiful. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my thing is sea turtles. Like I like to go snorkeling oh, and hang yeah. out with the, with the sea turtles. I, I imagine because of Finding Nemo that they all have Australian accents. For sure. Um, and there's, you know, they're super chill, laid back. Um, Good day, AG. Yep. All of them. <laughs> if they could. <laughs> they're just so rad. And they're just like, hey, what's up? We're just hanging out. Um, it is illegal to sit on them though. So don't do that. Uh, I oh dear. Do, I, I did not find that out from experience. I just thought that was funny. When I was little, there was a neighbor down the street that used to, real quick, I promise, but used to save um, zoo animals. So she worked in the zoo and they couldn't keep the sick ones there all the time. So she would take them home and rehabilitate them. And I probably wasn't more than four or five, four or five. And I would go over there and hang out. And there was Iggy the iguana who had like one foot and he'd hang out in the window. And so I just sat down one day and we were talking and wouldn't you know it, fucking rock I sat on, got some legs, lifted up, started walking across the room because it was a giant tortoise. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. I thought you you might be a felon. You yeah, it didn't hurt him. him. I only weighed like a buck oh five soaking wet in <laughs> jeans, but still. <laughs> That's adorable. Whoa. Uh, if you have some good news stories or personal, political, whatever, just want to send your pod pets photos of your kids, grandkids, whatever it is. We would love love to hear from you. You just send them in by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. I will kick us off with a submission from Anonymous. Sending you healing pet power. First pick is of my two rescues, Cinnamon and Wheeler, when Wheeler was just a pup. 
Now you can see his natural snuggle skills were highly developed at a young age. He's now 80 pounds and still loves to snuggle. In particular, when anyone in our household is sick, Nurse Wheeler is there to provide a warm, heavy healing comfort. Assume the position on the couch or the bed, and he can tell if you're not feeling well. He climbs up and just smothers you with the warmth and love, and you will get the best deep sleep ever to help you heal. Sometimes he brings his toy to cheer you up. In fact, I believe he is capable of distorting the laws of physics and making himself heavier at will, like if you need to try to get up. It's like he knows what's best for you, and uh, you give up the struggle and go back to sleep. Anywho, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, AG. I'm sending you healing pet powers. I hope you feel better soon. Thank you. AG, look <sighs> at this. When dogs hug each when animals hug each other, I mean my heart melts. I know. They always know. I love that one where the two shepherds, like one just runs up and just puts his arms around yes. the other one. And I'm like, oh, dog hugs. I had a, a bad breakup years and years and years ago. And my very best friend in the world has a shagel, um, a shepherd beagle mix. And uh, we're best friends. Like, I mean, best friends in love with each other. But I had a bad breakup and I was, you know, heartbroken on the couch. And it was New Year's Eve, had too much to drink, passed out. Abby climbed up on the couch onto my chest, 40 pounds, and just sort of fell asleep and I just couldn't even I didn't want to move her it was like having the biggest dog weighted blanket she just knew I needed love the sweetest thing sweetest thing Uh, dogs over people especially right now okay Uh, (laughs) except these people that are writing in the next one's from anonymous pronouns she and her this is a confession forgive me gay fairy godmother for I have sinned I a traditionally anti-committal 36 year old gaby by pan woman I'm officially a failed hoe and and pretty sure classic lesbian trope at this point. I may or might not have decided to try online dating the evening of New Year's Day. While I was drinking the booze my brother got me for Christmas. 40 proof Sugarlands Appalachian banana pudding sip and cream. Oh, mm. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Okay. <laughs> while I was fresh out of while I was fresh out of batteries. This is going to be a great story. While I was fresh out of batteries. Now, if you know, you know. And clearly, alone and bored. I may not have been drinking this booze like it was going to extend my life force. And this may not have led to shameless flirting with an older woman. Which may or may not have led to the biggest proverbial game of chicken. Which may or may not have culminated with the concept of meeting up for a weekday hotel lesbian sexcapades. Yes. Just, I'm a little freaked out that it's COVID, but okay, whatever. I'm sure you took precautions. Just to add more spice to the game of chicken, I may or may not have sent this woman on a trip to a local sex shop to pick up the proper accoutrement um, to properly execute said sexcapades, which may or may not have led to unexpected dinner first, as I was clearly a hot mess of nerves, ending in fabulous sex, which may or may not have also led us to calling off of uh, calling off of work the next day to, to drive upstate. Uh, if you're counting, this meant our quote unquote first date was 24 hours long, which may or may not have led to having to be ca- tested for COVID again, which may or may not have led us to keep talking to one another, which may or may not have led to actual dates, which may or may not have led us to deciding to be quote-unquote exclusive, and then two days later deciding that there was no difference between exclusive and girlfriends over three margaritas because we may or may not have typically be anti-committal people. To recap, within two weeks of attempting to online date, I have somehow acquired a girlfriend, a $120 vibrator, and not COVID. <laughs> Congratulations, Anonymous. Keeping the trope alive. Damn Not right. She and her. That's beautiful. Congratulations. Keep us posted. Yes. All right. Next up is from Daphne. After listening to the good news the other day with the nutcracker at the Zoo Lights drive through <laughs> <laughs> seeing, <laughs> seeing the gingerbread costume while I was on a cricket run at the pet store. <sighs> It was like the world telling me to telling me to quit procrastinating. I finally bought a zoo membership as my holiday gift to myself. Pet tax, my cat Pistail in the gingerbread costume. <laughs> yeah, Pistail definitely works for the name because that is not a happy kitty. Do you mind if I do the next one too? That was kind of short. I do not mind. Could you imagine if I was like, yes, I do. It's my turn, AG. Okay, this one comes from... A- <laughs> <laughs> You got the girlfriend. I got the girlfriend COVID vibrator. Stuff. No COVID story. You definitely get to do Ashley's. Next up, Ashley pronoun she and her. Hello, Beans Queens. Been a long time listener. Just love being able to get the headlines and important topics each day. You're the highlight of my day. Oh, thank you, Ashley. 
My good news is that I took a moment today to write out postcards for a few of the Republican House members that voted for impeachment, Speaker Pelosi, the U.S. Capitol Maintenance and Cleaning Department, the U.S. Capitol Police, and a few of the brave officers who were involved in the insurrection. Aww. I was heavily involved in the Black Lives Matters marches in the summer of 2020 and believe we desperately need police reform. I felt it was important to thank them for protecting our lawmakers to the best of their ability. I've also seen many members of the GOP concerned for their own safety because of the way they voted during the impeachment. And I want to make sure they knew their vote was appreciated and important. It was the first time I've ever written to other members of Congress besides my own. Living in Texas, I wasn't even going to entertain my reps. I just hope these postcards put a smile on their faces and have helped them realize how important the truth is. If anyone listening wants to write, too, I'm sure they'd love the appreciation during this difficult time. For pod pet tax, I've included my two, quote, guard dogs, unquote. Harley is a red healer and never runs out of energy. Cisco is the black lab blue healer mix and is the biggest baby ever. They both insist on laying on only blankets, pillows, or clothes. Mm -hmm. and have a great day and keep being amazing your work is so needed right now you ladies rock look at these postcards are beautiful too oh i love healer dogs they are just the best <laughs> look at so so cute into tongues the, the one in the second picture on the right looks very concerned oh very concerned about your well-being are you gonna give us that treat that's what it looks like is happening yeah hey hey yeah hey, hey that's my okay all right, everyone. This next one comes from Erica, pronouns she and her. Hello, Beans Queens. Here's my good news slash story. My mother moved to Southern California to Northern California two years ago to be close to the grandbabies, who are now 10 and 8. Moving up here is very tough for her because she had to sell her house and move away from the area she grew up in and where she was comfortable. But it's also a necessity to know she was safe in a responsible retirement community because she is very prone to falling and my anxiety level was through the roof on mm. days that I could not tr that I uh, would try to call and she would not pick up. I, I would go crazy. Mm. Any, anywho, her community has been thankfully very strict about visitors during the quarantine. And so she hasn't seen her grandkids in person since February, March. So almost a year. And that was the only reason she moved here in the mm. first place. Not me, of course. <laughs> uh, it was heartbreaking because she was starting to get a little depressed. But I would try and lighten her spirits with Zoom calls. But they just weren't the same. But here's the good news portion of the story. She got her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine yesterday and is scheduled for her second one, her second one in three weeks. Woohoo! Uh, her community sent me this picture of her after the vaccination, and this is the message she wanted to send. For Pod Pit Tax, here are two kitties, Izzy, the six-year-old Flame Point Siamese, who's a little neurotic but sweet, and our Chunkamunko, uh, four-year-old Tabby Sylvester, 16 pounds, wearing the hat that my eight-year-old made for him. He's a pretty good patient <laughs> boy, thank goodness. Yeah, I, I got to see this eight-year-old hat. Oh, first of all, this is so great. I'm a COVID-19 vaccinated superhero, and there's it. grandma holding a sign that says, I can't wait to hug my grandkids. Oh, oh there's a flame point. I had one who just looked just like this. His name was Dipstick. Pretty kitty. Oh, that hat. There's the hat. That's beautiful. Not a, per not a happy kitty, but a pretty kitty and not a happy kitty. Mm -mm. No, cats and hats are generally not happy. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. I just scrolled to the next picture. Well, I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Next up, Maverick. Pronouns he and him. Maverick. Salutations, bean, Beans Queens. This is Palace Dog. My Hugh mom wrote to you a few months ago and shared my pictures for the pet tax. You ladies said I looked like a palace dog versus a junkyard dog. And since I quite like the descriptor, I've decided to start acting more regally. I now request my breakfast served on my cot where my humans have been training me to stay put. See attached photo. If I'm not allowed to leave my throne, then I might as well be properly fed. I also come bearing good news. I was born with a heart murmur that many humans and vets thought may clear up on its own, but it hasn't. This left my humans feeling quite anxious for the past few months, wondering if I would need surgery, medicines, or worse, keel over while zooming around the backyard. They decided to take me to a cardiologist to figure out exactly what was going on, and today they drove me an hour and a half away, fearing the worst. But the best news was given instead. I have a goofy heart, but it shouldn't pose any long-term harm. I go back in a year. Me too. Me, yeah, I was going to say, I got a goofy heart too, Maverick. But yeah, it doesn't pose any harm. <laughs> I go back in a few years uh, for a recheck to monitor both my hole and four leaky valves. Yes, this is good news because the hole is small in my heart and apparently all four valves leaking isn't a concern. Who knew? Thanks for bringing the news to my Hugh mom every day. You make her smile and laugh, and that makes my goofy heart happy, too. Aww. I've attached my tax with pictures of me on my throne eating breakfast one of my, with my snowy snout 
and one on Christmas with my new toys. Look at this. I mean, that is a very regal dog. Oh, 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 the snow. So, so, oh, the snowy snout picture. Oh my goodness. So cute. Thank you for that. If they were in West Hollywood, that might be cocaine, but it's not. It's just snow. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's Tony Montana. How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> say hello to my little friend. I'm like a snow. How you doing? <laughs> All right. Uh, this uh, next one comes from Hadari Mac. I hope I'm saying that right. Hadari Mac, pronouns he and him. Thanks for denauseating the U.S. national news, which currently has all of the gruesome appeal of a bad traffic accident. Fuck, I love your li- I love the listeners. This is great writing. I know. To paraphrase one of your past U.S. presidents, your long national nightmare is almost over. Even though it's difficult to get a daily chuckle out of the Hindenburg levels of disaster, your podcast continues to somehow pull it off. I'll uh, get straight to the pet tax. Although my dad doesn't really care for pets, my mom does. So he brought home a cat back in 1963. Why? Because they were just married and she was asking him about having kids. So they've had a cat ever since. I'm assuming not the same one. They've had a cat ever since with only months separating the passing of one cat and the adoption of the next. Although my dad was never an animal lover, he's always respected the cats that they've owned. And my mom, being an animal lover, uh, he had to compromise and got a cat. Always just one cat and always a female one. When their most recent cat, a short-haired Tordy, passed in September, my mom was saddened by it, but started saying that she wanted to adopt another one weeks later. My dad provided some pushback by pointing out, much more diplomatically, that their combined age was 158. (laughs) He was not looking forward to the idea of having a pet that would outlive the two of them, especially if he was the first to go, since his help was needed in caring for the animal. But he compromised, and last month they adopted two brother cats which is interesting because i thought there was just one at a time so somehow he really lost that the man may be the head of the household but the woman is the neck and the woman can turn the head however she wants that's hilarious (laughs) my parents brought two cat carriers to bring them home but they both walked into the same one oh they're by far the most sociable cats my parents have ever had and my dad is frequently buying them new toys and giving them more attention than he did with their previous cats he's also taken all of the pictures of of them including these ones so hopefully these pet pics will help alleviate an ongoing tire fire of the inane clown posse as a canadian of course you're a good writer as a canadian the work mm. you do at the daily beans <clears throat> helps keep the news entertaining while keeping me thankful that i am a canadian uh mm. just less a week until freedom let me start that over just less than a week to go until freedom though and the start of a new battle for an even better presidency Oh, these kitties. Oh, my goodness. They do love each other. They are hugging. Every picture. All Every the time. picture. It's the cutest damn thing. Every picture. No wonder they love them so much. But that's funny. Combined age of 158. And I do like thanks for denauseating the U.S. national news. That is fantastic. What a great way to say it. Yeah, I might tweet that out. Thank you, Hadari Mac. I appreciate that. And thanks to everyone who sent in a story. We really, really appreciate you. Um, I can't begin to tell you how much. And then thanks for all the well wishes. I'm feeling much better. I still have a little weirdness in the throat. <clears throat> and I'm still, you know, working to get 100%, although I think I'm close. Good. Uh, and, you know, I took, I just took some days off and it made all the difference in the world. So Good. I listened. I listened to my own advice. I'm proud of you. It's hard. It's hard to do. It is yeah. hard to do. I'm proud of you. Yeah. All right. Well, any final thoughts before we get out of here? No, we are almost there. Home stretch, a couple days, buckle in. Some st- stuff might go down. Just stay in stides, stay safe, and just know that you are truly safe in your home. So just stay there, okay? And watch it on TV and enjoy it. And he's gone. He's gone in two more days. Mm-hmm. And I just Googled pardons and still no pardon list as of 5 p.m. Pacific time, Sunday. So we'll keep an eye on it for you. Until then, everybody, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of the planet, and take care of your mental health. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the Beans. The Daily Beans is directed, written, and hosted by executive producer Allison Gill and engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Audio. Staff writers include Dana Goldberg, Amy Carrero, and Allison Gill. Our copy is written by Jesse Egan, and our marketing manager, executive assistant, and social media director is Kanai. Fact-checking and research by Allison Gill, Dana Goldberg, and Amy Carrero. Our music is written and performed by They Might Be Giants. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder of Moxie Design Studios. And our website is dailybeanspod.com. <laughs>